great pleasure to welcome you to our online discussion, Fighting Hate Speech, Global Perspectives. First, a few housekeeping notes. We are recording today's discussion and we will share this with you. We invite you to post your questions and comments in the Q&A chat throughout the program. And we will address these final uh, questions in the final section of today's program. And if we could kindly ask you to please include your name, where you're writing in from, and your institution in those comments in the chat. Thank you. Today's event is jointly organized by the United Nations Academic Impact, the Holocaust and the United Nations Outreach Program, the outreach program on the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, and the United Nations Outreach Program on the Transatlantic Slave Trade and Slavery. Today's event is episode seven of the series Beyond the Long Shadow, Engaging with Difficult History. Welcome, everyone. In two days time on Saturday, 18 June, we'll be marking the first International Day for Countering Hate Speech. International days are important moments of global reflection and provide a chance to show our solidarity and our commitment to taking action to confront hate speech. Perhaps like me, you will remember being told as a child that sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt you. Sadly, words never were nor are without power. We know that a kind word can help someone feel human again and feel hopeful. And we know as well that words can diminish, hurt, and dehumanize. Hate speech is dangerous. We have painful examples of this throughout our shared history. The perpetrators of atrocity crimes use hate speech to justify the violence they encourage or enact. The sides, crimes against humanity, and hate crimes. For example, the Nazi regime weaponized hate speech to justify ultimately its policy of systemic murder carried out in the death camps. Atrocity crimes such as the Holocaust and the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda show the consequences of when governments encourage and spread hate speech as a political tool. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, politically motivated hate speech is driving and denying historical facts, glorifying convicted war criminals, and driving society further apart. Hate speech, however, doesn't need government support to have deadly consequences, as the mass shooting in Buffalo in the United States recently revealed. Hate speech spread, spreads lies, it distorts the truth. It peddles toxic stereotypes to justify hateful action. An increase in incidence of hate speech is a bellwether, a warning that cannot go unheeded. Hate speech undermines the right to live with dignity. It encourages division and polarization, the dehumanization of fellow humans, and it incites violence. Hate speech threatens the social contract and it weakens the bonds of common humanity that tie us together. Hate speech is a powerful weapon, whether it is wielded by governments or individuals who wish to demonize and dehumanize a group or groups of people to incite, encourage, or even enact lethal hate crimes. If we are to counter hate crimes and worse, we have to counter hate speech. The transformative power of education is fundamental to, uh, to address the root causes and drivers of hate speech and to promote peaceful, inclusive, and just societies for all in line with the 2030 Sustainable Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. Tackling the issue of hate speech from an educational perspective requires strengthening educational policies and programs with specific measures aiming to address and counter hate speech, drawing upon global citizen education and media information literacy initiatives and adopting multi-stakeholder interdisciplinary and society-wide approaches. 
in order to help young people engage with media and information, develop critical thinking and lifelong learning skills, and also become active citizens who support peace and human rights. Today, we have invited representatives of academic institutions to share with us their perspectives on hate speech and actions to confront and counter it. We are very pleased to have with us Dr. April Williams from the University of Michigan, Professor Tarlik McGonigal from the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, and the Co-Rapporteur Committee of Experts on Combating Hate Speech, Council of Europe. Also, Professor Caitlin Carlson from the University of Seattle in the United States, Professor Iginio Gagliardone from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, and Professor Ahmad Shahid from the University of Essex in the United Kingdom, and the United Nations Human Rights Council Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief, United Nations Human Rights Council. We look forward to hearing from all of our panel members. The United Nations takes hate speech seriously and understands the danger it poses to the world. While hate speech is sadly not new, online platforms and social media have served to turbocharge the spread of hate speech wider and faster than ever before. Considering how to address the facilitation of the spread of hate speech online is an ongoing concern for the United Nations, and the United Nations is not alone. On 18 June 2019, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres launched the United Nations Strategy and Plan of Action on Hate Speech in response to growing racism, xenophobia, misogyny, anti-Semitism, and anti-Muslim hatred around the world. The UN system-wide initiative tackles hate speech, emphasizing the need to counter hate holistically and with full respect for freedom of opinion and expression while working in collaboration with relevant stakeholders, including civil society organizations, media outlets, tech companies, and social media platforms. The Secretary General tasked the Office for the Prevention of Genocide with leading on this important initiative. In our communications work, the United Nations has identified countering myths and disinformation and hate speech as global priorities. We have launched the hashtag no to hate digital campaign. This is the visual you saw on the invitation to engage and mobilize our global audiences. And all of you joining today, we hope that you recognize the dangers of hate speech and that you will also take action by saying hashtag no to hate. Today, we are extremely honored to have to open our discussion, the person who heads this initiative, Under Secretary General, Alice Nadeiratu, Special Advisor of the United Nations Secretary General on the Prevention of Genocide. Welcome, Under Secretary General Nadeiratu, and thank you. Um, I see you're ready and you've unmuted and turned your camera on. We're so happy to have you with us. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jayashri. And thank you very much to all of you who have uh, spared the time to be with us um, today, this morning, this evening, uh, this afternoon, for all of you joining um, across the globe. And um, most sincerely, um, thank you for extending this invitation to you, the Department of Global Communications, um, for us to discuss fighting hate speech uh, global perspectives. Um, I lead an office with a global mandate and I look at situations worldwide, um, considering a potential escalation to commission of atrocity crimes. We collect and analyze information on risks of genocide. We follow up on sources, including field visits to verify information. And we use the framework of analysis of atrocity crimes, which is a tool that has been developed by my office to assess risks of genocide and other atrocity crimes. 
And with the verified information, we provide early warning on actions to prevent or halt genocide to the Secretary General and Security Council on situations that could escalate to atrocity crimes. So my office, um, as Jayashri has said, leads the implementation of the United Nations Strategy and Plan of Action on his speech, which was launched by the Secretary General in 2019. This strategy sets out guidance for United Nations entities and other societal actors to address hate speech at the national and global level to enhance efforts to tackle the root causes and drivers of hate speech, including racism and racial discrimination, therefore enabling effective responses by the United Nations system to the impact of hate speech on societies. The strategy is in line with the international human rights standards and with the right to freedom of opinion and expression. In this office, we receive daily uh, cases of hate speech against people because of who they are, their ethnicity, religion, culture, or even physical characteristics. People being discriminated for no other reason than their identity. We see a lot of anti-religious hatred against Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, or Christians, and even atheists. We have seen uh, anti-Semitism through online hate speech, graffiti in Auschwitz of all places, uh, desecrated cemeteries, and horrendous attacks such as happened at the Tree of Life Synagogue in uh, Pittsburgh here in the US, which I visited last year. Refugees and migrants have become the scapegoats of problems in many societies. Xenophobia and racism against indigenous people and poor of African descent continue to be very present. Political leaders uh, continue to bring hate-fueled ideas and language into the mainstream. Um, they direct hateful rhetoric at anyone they consider the other, which results in hate-based violence. So I've therefore looked forward to this meeting on global perspectives as a much-needed platform for ideas to address these dangerous trends, to raise awareness about the lessons of the past, um, to prevent all pop populations from the crime of genocide and other atrocities. So in July last year, uh, we supported the passing of a resolution uh, by the General Assembly of the United Nations, um, which recognized the importance of interreligious and intercultural dialogue and its valuable contribution to promoting social cohesion, peace and development and encountering hate speech. So this resolution proclaimed 18th June as the International Day for Countering Hate Speech. So this Saturday, tomorrow, will be the very first day that we shall have um, an International Day for Countering His Speech. And the same resolution requested the President of the General Assembly to organize a high-level meeting on his speech to mark the commemoration of the first such International Day. So because June 18th this Saturday, this um, debate, this high-level meeting of the General Assembly on his speech will happen on Monday, on the, the 20th. So we do know that hate speech is a precursor to the commission of serious international crimes, from the Holocaust to the genocides in Rwanda and in Srebrenica. More recently, of, we've seen, of course, hate speech uh, being strongly linked to violence that has resulted in killings in several regions of the world, um, including Central African Republic, in Myanmar, in Sri Lanka. And we know that hate speech takes several forms, from threats to dehumanization and polarization. So I'll... I'll Speaking of um, the definition, the Secretary General's United Nations Strategy and Plan of Action on hate speech defines hate speech as any kind of communication in speech, writing or behavior that attacks or uses pejorative or discriminatory language with reference to a person or a group on the basis of who they are based on their religion, ethnicity, nationality, race, color, descent, gender or other forms of identity. This is often rooted in and generates intolerance and hatred and in certain contexts can be demeaning and divisive. Globally, um, we do not have any universal legal definition of hate speech, but we do have important guiding documents. However, uh, what we've noted is that hate speech continues to increasingly, increasingly uh, become recognized as a precursor and indicator of risk for violence including atrocity crimes, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and that a considerable amount of academic research in understanding, recognizing, and addressing hate speech has taken place in the last uh, decade. So the commitment of the United Nations to address and counter hate speech in line with international human rights standards has seen a groundswell of support from social media companies, civil society, and governments to recognize the UN definition of on hate speech. 
in the absence of a um, universal definition on hate speech. So my office has supported globally several UN country teams, peacekeeping and special political missions and member states, too many to name here, to develop and implement context-specific action plans on hate speech. My office uh, facilitated the development of a global plan of action for religious leaders and actors to prevent incitement to violence that could lead to atrocity crimes, also called the first plan of action, with the help of religious actors from different faiths and beliefs. It includes options that religious actors, as well as other societal actors, can consider implementing to prevent and counter hate speech and incitement to violence in situations at risk of atrocity crimes. So we are currently implementing an outcome document based on a global ministerial conference that my office held in partnership with UNESCO, chaired by the Secretary General Antonio Guterres and attended by ministers of education worldwide on the role of education in addressing and building resilience against his speech. We are supporting scholars in the development of examinable courses and academic modules incorporating genocide studies and prevention into existing teaching. This includes uh, teaching on countering hate speech. So we are strengthening the capacity of teachers and learners to recognize and address hate speech. So as hate speech continues to spread online, my office continues to engage tech and social media companies globally on their role and responsibility to address online hate speech in line with international human rights standards and norms with a view to discuss the implementation of the Secretary General's United Nations Strategy and Plan of Action on Hate Speech in the online space. So some key challenges include what to do when hate speech does not reach the threat of incitement or when it's in languages that tech and social media companies do not have translation for. And last year, I briefed the Security Council on the global topic of tech and social media companies addressing and countering hate speech. And I invited tech and social media companies to brief with me. So I do urge that we engage online um, on hate speech with certain, uh, we, we engage online hate speech with certain realities. Hate speech thrives everywhere, even when it's not amplified by social media. And millions of people are missing in this digitally enabled conversations. His speech was present in the preparation of the Holocaust, in which six million Jews were murdered, uh, with Adolf Hitler's rich Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, headed by Joseph Goebbels, indoctrinating people to Nazi ideology, the core of which was anti-Semitism through newspapers, radio, broadcast and films. We may not recognize, we may not have named that as hate speech then, but it is hate speech. In Rwanda too, we know the role hate speech played on radio, projecting propaganda against Tutsi, moderate Hutu, the Belgians and the United Nations, leading to the genocide against the Tutsi. So we have begun um, the process of supporting UN member states to develop their own plans of action on hate speech. And yesterday, one country, uh, Kenya, launched uh, the first plan of action on countering hate speech. We are also studying hate speech legislation, pointing out to UN member states when it's vague, punitive, or could be compromised towards selective justice, especially through arbitrary enforcement. So as I conclude, I would say that dealing with hate speech on a daily basis has led me to a few questions. And I ask myself, why is it so difficult to stop hate speech? Why is there so much indifference collaboration and resistance to stopping hate speech? Is it because many people seem to have difficulty accepting that although we are all different, we should all be treated the same? You know, globally, we can build on the fact of the provision of protections through international laws and approaches that ensure states many people we interact with say they do not have the language to challenge hate speech in daily life. To give them this language, we need to learn more about those different from us in ethnic origin, religion, language, and teach more uh, about difference. More research on what constitutes hate speech with safeguards in the process of gathering and using such information must be enhanced. We must study historical patterns and traditions of hate speech. We need targeted policies, we need to devise social measures and action plans to address hate speech. Hate speech is a global problem and also a local problem. It is a problem created by human beings, therefore human beings can solve it. We do need to build traction globally for locally led initiatives on prevention of hate speech, prevention of genocide, with a clear knowledge that hate speech as an ideological construct can and has led 
to genocides. Thank you very much, and I look forward to fruitful engagement. Thank you so much, Undersecretary General Naderutu, for really a comprehensive and thought-provoking intervention. And I really think what you are saying about, you know, this is a problem created by humans and therefore it must be solved is really key to, to countering hate speech. The Secretary General also said, quote, hatred is a danger to everyone, and so fighting it must also be a job for everyone, end quote. So thank you very much for that. I just wanted to say that um, my colleague Omar has dropped into the chat our um, hashtag uh, say no to spe hate speech. Um, there's a link there, so please, we hope that everyone who's engaged in this dialogue here that you'll click on it to learn more about the actions you can take and please share it very widely with your networks. I also just wanted to say we are very thrilled. We've got colleagues joining us from Nigeria, Grenada, Kenya, Portugal, United States, India, Ghana, Japan, Peru, Nepal, Uganda, um, Switzerland, UK, Trinidad and Tobago, Netherlands, Bangladesh, Iraq, Germany, Egypt, and Pakistan so far. So this truly is a global conversation um, uh, around global perspectives. So it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Um, Tarlik McGonigal is a professor of media law and information society at Leiden University and an associate professor at the University of Amsterdam, the Netherlands. He regularly writes expert studies on freedom of expression, media, and minorities for the Council of Europe, the EU, and the OSCE, and the Uni United Nations. He recently served as co-rapporteur of the Council of Europe's Committee of Experts on Combating Hate Speech. Welcome, Professor McGonigal, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be joining you here today. Thank you to the organizers for the excellent preparations and thank you to all of you for your interest. It's a common tip for public speaking that you should give your audience something new, something they've never heard before, a new source, a new insight, or best of all, if you can pull it off, a scoop. Now today I have a mini scoop for you. It's it's mini because it's a few weeks old, but on the 20th of May, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe adopted a new recommendation on combating hate speech. The recommendation is directed at the 46 member states of the Council of Europe. Uh, the organizers advised that it might be interesting to address some of the relevant details of this recommendation. It's my pleasure to do so. Up front, what I can say is that you will see strongly in this recommendation uh, a lot of similarities to the UN approach that has already been uh, described um, in, in this panel. And namely, you see that it's a holistic approach is required to effectively combat hate speech in all of its different forms and manifestations. And nobody's going to be able to do that on their own. It really demands a multi-actor uh, response and often in, in collaboration. So these are two themes that you can already see uh, in the recommendation. So I will briefly introduce the recommendation and its most salient provisions for today's discussion. And I will then explore the space that it creates for university communities to encounter hate speech within their physical, virtual, social, and intellectual spaces. The recommendation is not legally binding, but it is politically persuasive. Uh, it's an advice or guidelines to uh, the member states. This is an important document because it's the only the third time that the Council of Europe has frontally and in considerable detail engaged with the topic of hate speech in high level policy or political uh, standard setting texts. In 1997, the Committee of Ministers, which is the statutory uh, decision making body of the Council of Europe, adopted uh, twin recommendations, the first one on hate speech and the second on promoting a culture of tolerance in the media. In 2015, a bit of a jump into the future, the ECRI, 
which is the European Commission uh, Against Racism and Intolerance, uh, the Council of Europe's designated monitoring body uh, for racism and intolerance, adopted a, a general policy recommendation uh, focusing on uh, hate speech and in particular online hate speech. And now uh, in May, this uh, second uh, frontal engagement by the Committee of Ministers with the benefit of growing insights into the causes and manifestations of hate speech, the particularly problematic nature of online hate speech, which because uh, it, of its permanency on, online, that it has compounding and enduring uh, effects, which uh, 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 reinforces and compounds the harms uh, 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 for the victims uh, of, of, of hate speech. So the recommendation provides detailed guidance to state actors and importantly to other stakeholders on how to raise their game and combat hate speech more effectively. More specifically, it sets out uh, principles and guidelines on a comprehensive approach to co combating hate speech. It has focuses on scope and definition, legal framework, or we could better say legal frameworks because within the legal framework, there is differentiation between criminal law on the one hand and civil and administrative law on the other. The recommendation also pays particular attention to uh, legislation governing the online context. Recommendations to key actors follows then, and this concerns in particular public officials, elected bodies, political parties, internet intermediaries, media and civil society organizations. Each of these actors has clear roles uh, in combating hate speech and rights and duties and responsibilities when fulfilling those roles. The next focus is the one that's most relevant for us today. That's awareness raising, education, training and the use of counter spe speech and alternative speech. And the final focuses are support for those targeted by hate speech, monitoring and analysis of hate speech and national coordination and international cooperation. Now, I know it's not very interesting to just go through a list of headings in a document, but the purpose here is really to show the breadth of the recommendation and the importance of the holistic or the differentiated approach that is taken, just uh, uh, as, as, as it is the approach of the UN in the UN strategy and, and plan of action, for example. Um, so it, the recommendation takes its ambition to be comprehensive quite seriously. The, Hate speech is a deep-rooted and complex phenomenon that manifests itself in countless ways and contexts. So effective action to counter its harmful consequences, which themselves vary, uh, requires necessarily a range of actions by a range of actors. Now, despite being modern and uh, aspiring to be future-oriented, and despite being differentiated, the recommendation says precious little about university education in particular. The focus on education is tucked away or, if you like, carefully aligned with awareness raising, training and the use of counter speech and alternative speech. Now, this is, an al is a logical alignment of preemptive and countermeasures. But on the other hand, it means that um, education is, is, is one of uh, one item in a list. So an important thing to realize about recommendations like this is that even though they're direct, directed at state actors, they're very valuable tools for civil society and other stakeholders. So what this recommendation tries to do as regards education is stress its importance and encourage appropriate measures that will be effective in different ways when it comes to uh, um, countering hate speech. Um, but it's and it hopefully opens up a space for more detail and uh, more programmatic approaches um, uh, at, at a more granular level at the national and local levels. So it opens up a space and then it's up to, I think, the university communities to fill that space as best they can. Um, so one way of doing that, I think, that is very important is uh, to take the metaphor that the U European Court of Human Rights often uses when it's dealing with these issues, and that's to create a favorable environment for inclusive um, but robust public debate uh, in which everyone can participate without fear. And a, an important element in this favorable environment is to realize the impact that uh, hate speech can have 
on others. And so it's very important to have red lines uh, of protection to prevent hate speech from, from contaminating public debate, as it were, but also to really invest in the measures that will work in a preemptive uh, way to uh, combat hate speech. Um, so there you go, uh, uh, a quick little uh, introduction to the recommendation. I, I'd be happy to get back to the, the specific implications in uh, the questions and answers and by way of follow up afterwards. But one word of caution that I would give for this and other approaches is that sometimes education is seen as a soft measure. Um, Professor Stephanie Farrier once uh, called the provisions in the in international uh, international convention for the elimination of uh, all kinds of racial discrimination, Article Seven, about education. She called that the forgotten pillar because it isn't treated. Sometimes isn't treated as seriously as other measures. This is a very very powerful tool, as the Under Secretary I think mentioned just now, a very powerful tool for the longer uh, 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 engagement against hate speech and it requires operationalization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Professor McGonigal, for your excellent intervention and your words of caution and, and the background that you shared. We really appreciate that. Um, just wanted to add that we've also seen uh, colleagues signing in also from Mexico, Argentina, Lebanon and Sudan, and people are coming from a variety of different backgrounds, education, psychology, um, working in the field of violence against women and, and more. So just uh, giving a shout out to everybody who's here on the line as well. Thank you so much for joining. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Caitlin Ring Carlson. Professor Carlson is an associate professor in the Department of Communication and Media at Seattle University. Her primary research interests are in media law and policy as they pertain to new media, freedom of expression and social justice. Much of her work focuses on the subject of hate speech. Her first book, Hate Speech, was published by MIT Press in April of 2021. Her work on the regulation of hate speech by governments and by social media organizations has been published in law, gender equality, and freedom of expression, and media systems. She has a PhD in media studies from the University of Colorado. Professor Carlson, the floor is yours. And if I may, could I ask the previous presenters if you would be kind enough to um, continue to stay on mute and to shut off your cameras as well. Thank you so much, Professor Carlson, please. Thank you. I am just so honored to be here today among this group. Um, as a media studies professor, I couldn't resist the opportunity to uh, add visuals to my, my presentation. And so I have a um, PowerPoint I'd like to share. Uh, I actually, I think I'm hopefully going to be able to build on um, some of uh, kind of the space that Professor McConnell mentioned in terms of what the recommendation opens up in for the the university. Uh, I organized my remarks today around this kind of animating question, which is about the role of universities in combating hate speech. Uh, some of these are kind of big picture things, um, but others are specific things that we as educators can do in the classroom with our students to try to move the needle on this important issue. Um, I've got five recommendations, the first of which is I think we need greater uh, funding and greater commitment to interdisciplinary research um, and that that should be better shared with public and, and private entities. Um, I think there's incredible work, as others have mentioned, happening um, in the study of hate speech and monitoring hate speech and acting out against hate speech. Um, computer scientists, for example, are looking at kind of what AI can do to remove hate speech online. Medical professionals have now joined the fold and are looking at the physiological and psychological and emotional impacts on victims. Uh, media and information studies folks are are looking at the global dissemination of hate speech, but it feels to me as if this is still happening in silos. And so um, I put up a, a few examples here in the United States of entities that are 
working in an interdisciplinary way to address these issues. I would point to Gonzaga University's Institute for Hate Studies. Here at my university, we've got the Initiative in Ethics for Transformative Technologies. Essentially, it brings together scholars from dis different disciplines to address these issues. So, for example, here at Seattle University, I'm working with computer science professors to develop a bot that can better understand the context surrounding hate speech. I think the other piece of this um, recommendation is really about sharing what we've learned. So making sure that we are proactively reaching out to industry, to technology companies, to governments, to NGOs. Um, we can be a real, I think, resource to uh, everyone from the media covering incidents of bias and hate to the platforms, uh, to, to again, regulators, to all kinds of folks. Along those lines, my second recommendation is that universities become leaders in counter speech. We've already heard today about the importance of debunking the, the mis and disinformation that is associated with claims about people's identity um, that really comes to define hate speech. And so I think universities have a unique opportunity to support the victims of hate speech by vocally countering the erroneous claims that are made about people's race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, et cetera. And we can do this in a variety of ways, whether it's through protest or through media engagement. Um, you see here my my photo from the uh, kind of the COVID-19 claims around um, the, the role of Chinese folks in spreading the virus. Uh, absent from this discussion were, um, I think, uh, really strong voices from universities debunking this information. And so I think this is a real opportunity for us. Along those lines, I think, in, in, and we have so many people joining us today from across the globe. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with the United States approach to hate speech, but here in the US, hate speech is actually protected by the First Amendment. Unlike so many other countries, we really don't have legal prohibitions against hate speech. And so this can actually often result in hate groups coming to college campuses to protest. And this to me is a real opportunity for universities in the United States in particular to show the world really how we can thread the needle between um, respecting freedom of expression, but also uh, prioritizing human dignity. To me, this is not the time to talk about the need for um, robust public debate because this is what I would consider low value speech. This is not contributing to the political discourse. And we know that hate speech actually works to silence people from traditionally marginalized communities or people with uh, certain identities uh, from participating in political discourse. And so I think universities, when this happens, have a real opportunity to, whether that's um, denounce hate speech, um, to acknowledge the changing perspectives among young people about a willingness to restrict expression in certain ways in order to promote um, and allow space for all people to participate in political discourse. So this to me is really a time when all eyes are on us and we could, at least in the United States, be doing far more um, to denounce hate speech. In terms of what we do in the classroom, I think as instructors, so many of the people I saw logged on are, are professors and teachers. And I think what, what we can do is really help students understand the structural nature of hate speech. Um, I believe strongly that hate speech, and as others have said here today, is certainly not just words. Instead, it's a tool used by uh, people and groups in power to maintain uh, their position in the social hierarchy. We see throughout history uh, how hate speech has acted as a building block for bias, motivated violence and genocide. I love this image. It comes from the Anti-Defamation League uh, here in the United States, and it really um, I think helps demonstrate to students how these things, even as small as microaggressions to hate speech, create the conditions for discrimination and bias motivated violence. And so I think helping students understand kind of what hate speech is and how it works can then empower them to speak out against it. And I think we need to be teaching students specific ways, whether that's online or in person to uh, to, to speak with the, the people in their community, their friends, their family, um, to speak out online, to really be that, that bystander that intervenes. Um, I think students have the capacity to really move the needle on this issue. And the last thing I wanna advocate for 
is accountability. Um, I'm certainly not in favor of what we would call cancel culture, but I am a big fan of consequence culture. And I think that there needs to be consequences for the organizations, the individuals, the groups that uh, promote hate speech. I am excited about the Digital Service Act coming out of the E. Uh, the European Commission and the EU. Um, I think Facebook's move towards an oversight board is at least a step in the right direction. I know Nets DG in Germany is not a perfect regulation, but I do think it's time to hold social media platforms in particular accountable uh, for for the hate speech that they help promote and disseminate. Um, I'm always talking to my students about, you know, how, how do we consider these issues online if we were thinking about them offline? And so, for example, if I were to invite people to my house to organize, um, to spread this kind of rhetoric, would I then be responsible? I think the answer is yes. And I think that same answer um, applies to these organizations. So with that, I'm going to conclude my remarks. And again, I'm just uh, so incredibly um, happy to be here and to be part of this conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Carlson. Um, and thank you for your recommendations, which I think are very concrete and they're ways that universities can begin, you know, implementation of, of some of these ideas on their campuses. And I just love the idea of universities becoming leaders in this space because I think teaching and understanding it eradicates some of the ignorance around these issues that are key to be able to combating it in a really sophisticated and and substantive way so thank you very much indeed it is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker Eugenio Gagliardone um, professor Gagliardone is Associate Professor in Media and Communications at the University of Witwatersrand, South Africa, and Associate Research Fellow in New Media and Human Rights in the Program in Comparative Media Law and Policy, University of Oxford. His work explores the relationship between new media, political expression, and human development and the emergence of distinctive models of information society in the global South. He is the author of China, Africa, and the Future of the Internet, The Politics of Technology in Africa, Cambridge University Press, and World Trends in Freedom of Expression and Media Development, UNESCO. His study, Countering Online Hate Speech, supported by UNESCO, has rapidly become one of the most cited publications in the field, highlighting the need to develop bottom-up and contextually informed responses to the emergence of online hatred. Professor Gagliardone, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Similarly to my previous colleagues, I'm incredibly honored to be part of this uh, group uh, and uh, this very diverse uh, uh, audience and group of participants. So I I'm going to offer a perspective from South Africa, which I hope uh, helps highlighting some of the complexities and the contradictions even of, of uh, aid speech uh, in general and online aid speech. because. Uh, there is not really one form of a speech, and uh, hate speech comes in, in different manifestations. So I'm going to start to, by using three different cases, uh, uh, some more recent uh, and some that dates back uh, uh, quite many years. So the first one is, is a prominent case uh, that we ha um, uh, are having in these uh, past few months uh, in South African courts uh, that uh, involves hate speech. And it involves uh, the leader of one of the most prominent uh, political parties in South Africa, the um, Economic Freedom Fighters, which happened to be a party on the far left. Often, uh, especially in Europe, uh, hate speech is, is considered to be uh, associated with the far right, but this is not, this is not the case. And uh, the reason why Julius Malema was taken to court is for having sung uh, an old anti apartheid uh, song. Uh, which happens to be very strongly worded uh, against uh, the white minority. Uh, the problem is that some who have contextual understanding of the politics of South Africa, uh, this is more than a dangerous act, it's a performative act. It's an act that speaks to constituencies uh, on the one side of the FF, on the other side uh, 
of the movement, uh, the Afri Forum, that took Julius Malema to court. So, and uh, uh, this is something that deserves attention and concern, uh, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's an act, uh, the singing of the song, uh, uh, that is very unlikely to produce uh, uh, violence, especially on a large scale. The second case is more problematic and, and more widespread. Uh, um, it's what in South African media is being uh, uh, usually referred to as xenophobic violence. These are very different kind of violence. It's violence that tends to be perpetrated uh, by black South Africans, mostly poor black South Africans, uh, against African migrants, from uh, some of them from the very countries uh, that has supported uh, uh, the fight uh, uh, against apartheid. And this is paradoxical and extreme, but this is a form of violence that has become increasingly widespread and is, is increasingly concerning because all major political parties uh, coming close to the elections that will happen soon uh, have sort of not certainly condoned violence, uh, but a sort of appease uh, an anti-immigration sentiment that, that is surprisingly very close uh, to the one that is uh, has been spreading in Europe uh, in the past decade. And the third case that I want to bring uh, uh, to the discussion is, is much older and uh, and refers to Steve Biko. And uh, I see a lot of uh, participants from Africa. Uh, Steve Biko was uh, an anti-apartheid activist, uh, was one of the founder of the Black Consciousness Movement. Uh, and he used to write uh, uh, a column that was called I Write What I Like. And, uh, and this column was very strongly worded, and it was considered by the apartheid regime as akin to a speech. It was seen as uh, insulting and uh, uncivil. At the same time, it was uh, a very impassionate way to denounce uh, um, uh, injustices uh, in the apartheid regime. So how do we deal with all these complexities? Uh, these could be considered uh, uh, by different sources, by different uh, observers, uh, all forms of a speech and how we deal with it in universities. Well, we we don't shy away from it. We don't uh, we, we we address this complexity uh, frontally and uh, we try to to offer an image not of hate speech as an absolute others. And uh, we are the civic, the civil who live in this space and and hate speech belongs to another space, uh, but it can be something that is very close to us. And uh, we do this in way that are proactive. One of uh, uh, the, the, the largest uh, uh, organization dealing with uh, most of this information, but also a speech online, which is Africa Check, uh, is a spin off uh, of uh, Wits University. And uh, we deal as a, as, a, as a teacher, as a lecturer, as a professor, uh, also in ways that can seem provocative, but uh, we found them very helpful. Uh, asking a group of our students uh, at a higher level, the honors level, the master level, uh, to uh, pretend to be to, to be creating a disinformation campaign and sort of step into the into the shoes uh, of people that are seen as very far, but uh, uh, but are not as much as uh, as uh, as we often think. And uh, and what we try to teach uh, also is to pay a lot of attention, not just to words, but to context. I saw one of the videos that were shared before, and I, if you allow me, I kind of disagree with one of its main points, which is it's all about words. Uh, a lot of it is context. Uh, we have uh, mentioned before the case of Myanmar. And one thing is having a country, a whole country that is united uh, uh, by sim supposed similar history and religion that it's persecuting uh, one small minority. One thing going back to the case of South Africa is undocumented migrants uh, whose presence is increasingly signaled uh, as uh, not wanted uh, by the largest political parties in the country. And one thing is, uh, and we've seen in our own research, uh, uh, the forms of certainly vitriolic, uh, uh, certainly antagonizing uh, uh, wording uh, that uh, if we only look at the word would count as a speech, uh, but are uttered by individuals with uh, very limited power towards the power that is seen as uh, as overwhelming. And, uh, and by proclaiming the importance of context, I also want to warn about context because uh, um, context is infinite. We can extend it as much as we want. 
And uh, and I have noticed uh, uh, before there was a mention of uh, uh, Facebook Oversight Board and uh, uh, and attempt to deal with hate speech by social networking platform. I have been invited to be part of some of these panels and uh, and these panels uh, of experts, uh, political science, anthropologists, uh, uh, sociologists, uh, I offer very limited information by Facebook uh, in order to make a claim uh, that is uh, considered contextual and uh, and uh, and we're given more or less an hour to offer our our evaluation and and the oversight board goes away with with sp spoken to the expert but actually the kind of uh, uh, input that we have provided uh, are very limited because they can't be otherwise so um it's uh, uh, it's important to 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 uh, understand when when we think about a speech uh, that it's there is it's relatively easy and probably too easy to to pitch it as as this absolute other something that exists out there and and become able and universities are getting better at doing this uh, with extreme level of complexity that uh, uh, is attached to specific cases uh, in specific countries and in specific community thank you thank you very much professor gagliardone that's uh, really really enlightening and i think the connection that you are drawing also between xenophobia and hate speech is a, a really crucial one. So thank you for making that connection. I think we'll we'll get into that a little bit more in the Q&A. Um, it is now my privilege and pleasure to introduce our next speaker, April Williams. Professor Williams is an assistant professor of communications and digital studies at the University of Michigan. She's also a faculty associate at Harvard University's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, a senior fellow in trustworthy AI at the Mozilla Foundation, and an affiliated researcher at NYU's Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies. Uh, Professor Williams studies race and racism at the intersection of digital spaces and algorithmic techno cultures. Her work on racism and hate speech has been published in leading interdisciplinary journals, including Social Media and Society and The Sociology of Race and Ethnicity. Her research has also been covered in popular press outlets. Professor Williams, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I'd first like to open with an acknowledgement I live and work on the historical lands of the Anishinaabe and their neighbors, the peoples of the Wyandot, Seneca, Delaware, and Shawnee nations. There are 12 Anishinaabe tribes in the state of Michigan. And despite settler colonialism from which we in the United States all benefit without reparations, many Anishinaabe people live and work at the University of Michigan and throughout the state. Um, I draw that attention first because I think as we're talking about hate speech, we often forget that it's in a larger context, uh, a larger global history in which we all take and share part of. Um, and that is colonialism and that's touched every continent um, and most people groups across the globe. So as uh, Professor Carlson talked about already, hate speech has no formal legal definition under US law. But we know that hate speech or speech that incites violence, discrimination, or attacks based on race, ethnicity, religion, or gender falls outside of the free speech provision afforded by the US Constitution. The thing about free speech, though, is that one is free to speak, but one is also free to suffer the consequences. And I really liked Professor Carlson's framing of consequence culture. We know that hate speech is often the precursor to many acts of violence throughout global history. And more recently in the US, the killing of those in fellowship at a Bible study at Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Those working at a spa in Atlanta, Georgia, and Saturday shoppers in Buffalo, New York. Sociologically speaking, laws are social contracts that were once implicit agreements that have been made explicit by writing them down and made real by governmental action on those ideas. Yet lawful hate speech protections in the US have such limited capacity to protect those in need because the heart of free speech is provisions for power. 
though the creators of the constitution may have intended that all have equal power, many of those framers and creators themselves owned enslaved peoples. There was no free speech for those enslaved peoples. They had no freedom. Hence, we should not rely on the framers of the US Constitution to guide ideas about free speech when we have since moved on from the days when owning another for profit or personal gain was widely accepted. Contemporary free speech narratives are about making space for those with power in society to assert and stabilize their power to maintain the status quo. When we think about power in the US, we have to think about whiteness specifically. When this country was founded, those who were in power were white slaveholders. Now we all have attempts at having some of the same power. We have the ability to participate in our government. We have to evolve to think about free speech in its proper context, to think about rules and society as protection for everyone and not just some, not just for those who already hold power. Free speech cannot be a blanket covering for hate speech. And we must all be willing to answer for consequences that come from the words that we speak. Ironically, an issue with great relevance to hate speech currently is whether or not we should talk about whiteness, power, and race in schools. Critical race theory is a movement, a practice, and scholarly perspective that aims to make clear the relationship between race, racism, and power. Here we are concerned with civil rights within appropriate and real historical context economic history, as well as contemporary economic realities and inequities. In the US, there is a growing movement that wishes to position critical race theory, or CRT, as hate speech, saying that critical race theory positions people of color against white people and that it ushers in white guilt. Those in opposition would rather not have us talk about, nor their children hear about, the United States and individuals and amasses, many in humanities. If we don't employ critical race theory to think about how today's murder of unarmed black women and men is a direct legacy of yesterday's law and order politics, segregationist stances, and slave patrols, we will continue to miss how the actions of individuals are tied up with and contribute to the public policy that impact the lives of people of color. If we don't teach our students to think critically about race, power, and society, they might never know that Dylan Roof was inspired by a Google search to go into a church in Charleston, South Carolina, and kill nine black members. His Google search for black on white crime led him to a white nationalist propaganda website, the Council of Conservative Citizens, where he consumed misinformation about statistics on black on white crime. And according to Sophia Noble, author of Algorithms of Oppression, if power had been balanced in this instance, this Google search would have instead generated accurate statistics about the reality of American crime, which is that a vast majority of all crime is committed by white individuals. Yet the Council for Conservative Citizens protected under free speech, and in this case by Google, were allowed to spread their misinformation. Power was in the wrong hands. This kind of systematic, systematic misappropriation of power runs rampant across the internet. And right now, a lot of people who are alarmed by the growing number of race-motivated mass shootings are asking, what will it take to end it? How can I be anti-racist? I'm here to share a little bit about Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, Anti-racist thought involves the knowledge of systemic and widespread racial discrimination and disenfranchisement, an admission that American meritocracy cannot exist in a world where racial disparity, where hate speech is the norm because it is protected under the ruse of free speech. Being anti-racist involves everyone admitting that they are part of a system that upholds racial inequity and that white individuals benefit in various degrees from white privilege, even if they themselves are not actively espousing racialized beliefs or white supremacist thought. Just as I, a black woman, benefits from the inhumane atrocities, such as historical forced migration of First Nations and indigenous people that paved the way for modern industrialization and development in the US from which we all benefit. Anti-racist action entails using that knowledge about our words, our ideas, our actions can dismantle existing systems of racial oppression and proactively taking steps to prohibit and inhibit the growth and rebuilding of new or adaptable racist systems of oppression including the widespread proliferation of hate speech. Inaction, rather, refusing to grapple with our com complicity in harm, the strength of our words will continue to mean that no one is truly safe, especially people of color who have been systematically harmed by the violent actions and outcomes spurred on by hate speech. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Williams, for such an enlightening, um, intervention. 
I think it's just so crucial that we understand the context because the power of the context, you know, creates a lot of the ways that we engage and the difference between hate speech that is racialized has power behind it, right? Um, of an entire systemic racist system. And so I think the nature of that power is 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 crucial as we're thinking about hate speech. So thank you for bringing that important concept into this conversation. Um, I'm excited to um, get into the Q&A session as well. Um, and just before we move on to our next speaker, please uh, let me just uh, say that we've also had colleagues join us from Indonesia, Australia, Cameroon and Liberia today as well. And um, we are thrilled to have have so many people from so many different countries who are joining us. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our final speaker of today's uh, excellent panel. All of the interventions have been extremely good. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Ahmad Shahid. Professor Shahid is a professor in the School of Law at the University of Essex in the United Kingdom. Professor Shahid is also the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief. His reports to the United Nations have covered combating anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim hatred and ways to protect, protect freedom of expression while countering hate speech. He's here today with his hat on from the University of Essex. Professor Shahid, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I want to begin by thanking you for inviting me to join this distinguished panel and to show the fascinating discussion on countering hate speech. I also, don't, I also do want to apologize for the quality of my voice to today. In my work as UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief, as just noted, I have focused a lot on combating hate speech, including issuing just last month an action plan to combat anti-Semitism globally. It is from this perspective of, from, of my UN work that I would like to speak today. As societies have become more diverse and means of communication have proliferated, the spread of hate has increased exponentially. The ease with which prejudice and disinformation can be circulated globally and the ability of emerging technologies to undermine human agency in accessing information present serious challenges not just for our search for the truth, but also to our ability to act responsibly. Even without this distorting role of technologies that undermine our freedoms of thought and opinion, countering hate speech presents numerous challenges as speakers have already noted. One conundrum is the contextual nature of what constitutes hate speech and the linked question of how to protect freedom of expression while combating hate speech. We can clearly assert what we should not do, that is to prohibit any expression that does not reach the high threshold of incitement to violence set by international human rights law. The Rabat Plan of Action, which is affirmed by Resolution 309, which made, today, which made 18 June the day, day to counter hate speech, offers guidance in determining that threshold through the use of a six-part threshold test. However, we should also recognize a second challenge, that is, we should not allow hateful speech that does not reach the, the threshold to go uncontested. The Rabat Plan of Action does recommend a sliding scale of responses to hate speech. Where this threshold has not been met, influential speakers must offer counter narratives that reject hateful discourses. Why is this important? I stress two points. As I note in my work on combating anti-Semitism, and as some of you have already noted, the Holocaust did not begin with the gas chambers. It began with words, prejudice and bias, which escalated unchecked genocide. And this is the core message of the ADF pyramid of hate that Professor Carlson just highlighted. The second point, and I stress this in my report on Islamophobia and relates to what was just now said by Professor Williams, is that what makes hate speech particularly hateful is the dynamics of power involved. When powerful speakers target vulnerable communities, hate speech can become dangerous. Such hate speech can result in depriving these communities access to the public space or the exclusion from society through fear and stigmatization, and therefore expose them even to greater harm. Whether it is the auctioning of journalist Rana Ayub 
and other Muslim women in India in online spaces, or the designation of Ahmadis as non-Muslims in Pakistan. It is the assertion of majoritarian power or a minority that makes such speech acts so dangerous. And what aggravates vulnerability is the denial of the equal protection of the law for minority communities. Of course, one should not jump to the conclusion that stronger regulation of hate speech is the answer. Criminalization of hateful speech would be misguided unless such regulation was tied to the high threshold of intentional incitement to imminent violence. I have consistently also opposed the use of anti-blasphemy laws. Such laws invariably end up as an assertion of majoritarian privilege and power and risk life and limb minorities and also undermine the rule of law. The horrific murder of Deborah Samuel in University in Nigeria just last month is one of many examples of what anti-blasphemy laws can do. Thus, rather than prohibit speech that offends a majority, what is required are measures to uphold the equal dignity of every human being, to guarantee access to the public space to all and ensure equal protection of the law for every, everyone. What is needed is the promotion of what Professor Chirian George in his similar study on hate, on hatred called hate spin, calls radical pluralism. In the work that I am doing with the UN within the framework of Faith for Rights, which brings together people of all faiths and none, we highlight the role of peer-to-peer -peer engagement as an excellent way to break down prejudice and barriers of ignorance. I have visited countries where the education system is organized along faith lines, that young people do not get to meet people of other faiths or ethnicities until they finish schooling and enter the workforce. Unfamiliarity with those who are different makes people particularly vulnerable to exploitation by fear mongers. At Essex, I have championed UNESCO's Declaration of Principles of Tolerance. It conceptualizes tolerance not as forbearance, but as the active acceptance of those who are different in all our diversity. It is a vital tool for educators. As already mentioned, in addition to the numerous measures of interfaith, intercultural engagement, education in the UN resolution that we are marking today, there must also be a focus on the role of social media and tech companies in ensuring they exercise due diligence in fulfilling human rights responsibilities. The Human Rights Council has asserted that emerging technologies must comply with human rights due diligence in their full life cycle from design, development, deployment and evaluation. Resolution 309 repeatedly expresses concern over how growing religious intolerance drives hate. I therefore want to recall the definition of intolerance offered in the UN Resolution 3655 of 1981, to which my UN mandate is tied. It defines intolerance as any distinction, exclusion, restriction, or preference based on general belief whose purpose or effect is the nullification or the impairment of the recognition or the enjoyment of any civil, political, economic, social, cultural right. Therefore, crucial to combating hate speech is ensuring societal inclusion for everyone, the recognition of their inherent dignity as equal members of the human family, as noted in the preamble of the UN Charter, as the foundation of peace, freedom, and justice in the world. This emphasis on equal dignity also flags the important point we must, that we must right-size the role of religion, both as a driver of violence and as a means of fostering peace and not ignoring other relevant factors. It is for this reason that what is required to combat hate speech is a hollow society approach that leaves no one behind, as we have pledged in the SDG agenda. The overall lesson that I have learned in my work is that the opposite of hate is inclusion, and that is what we must aim for. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Shahid. You're you're absolutely right that what we're striving for is a world of inclusion. And uh, there's no place in that world of inclusion for hate speech. And thank you also for touching on, you know, the tension between free speech and hate speech as well. I think there's there's some questions on that from the audience as well. Um, so I'd like to turn now to the questions and comments our audience has been sending through. And um, perhaps I can also ask the uh, colleagues who are on the panel. And once again, I would just like to thank all of our extremely insightful presenters today who have joined us. And I would also like to thank my team here at UN headquarters who organized this. I'd like to thank Ms. Tracy Peterson, who manages the Holocaust and the United Nations program and her colleague, 
Bo Lee, who worked very hard on this. I'd also like to thank Mr. Omar Hernandez um, for the, from the United Nations Academic Impact, who has also worked hard on this event, as well as Mr. Brendan Varma from the Transatlantic Slave Trade Program, um, who has also contributed, and Ms. Julia Hoggle from the um, Rwanda um, genocide from the 1994 um, genocide against the Tutsi. Yes in Rwanda. So um, it's been a real team effort from this from this side. Um, so I'd like to um, first pitch the first question and it reads, this is from Stephanie Obi. It says, I am a Cameroonian refugee in Nigeria and I receive a lot of hate speech on a daily basis. I want to be one of the solution providers to this problem in our society because it's created by us and should or must be addressed by us collectively. So I want to ask if a community of fighters of hate speeches could be created where we could tackle this together. And um, I think just looking at how, how do we deal with it on an individual basis as well. So I know um, Professor um, Tarlick McGonigal, you were speaking a little bit about this um, but he has, I think, had to leave if I'm not mistaken. So we could perhaps throw this question to Professor Gagliaro uh, Done, please. Well, it's not it's not a simple question. Uh, um, it isn't, no. Not a simple question to answer. But one of the things that we are trying to do in uh, universities in, in the global south in, uh, in, in Africa is sort of empowering the, the, the ability to understand uh, the complexity of aid speech, uh, both through different methods of research and uh, and uh, computational social science has been used and abused also to to uh, to analyze aid speech. The problem with uh, these kind of methods based on large data sets that often comes with a very normative load. So there is again a very supposedly a very clear distinction uh, between what is uh, not hate speech and what is hate speech. And what is missing is the contextual information. So it happens very often that research on Nigeria or on South Africa or on Kenya happens very far from those contexts. It happens in the United States or in the United Kingdom. And so one of the things that we're trying to do, and this is a very long process, uh, is empowering uh, uh, young scholars or scholars in general in uh, our universities uh, to be able to handle both the computational powers, the ability to search and mass data and, uh, and uh, the, the ability to, to see through this. Uh, and, and once certain networks are, are identified or understood, uh, it becomes not easier, but uh, it's, it's a more empowering uh, 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 process uh, rather than leaving it to an institution as powerful as it, uh, it, it could be to, to define and to combat. Uh, uh, things can get closer into the hands of the people who participate in those spaces uh, and uh, rather than being activated because they're part of uh, an NGO or an international group uh, doing it themselves. And uh, Africa at the same time is, uh, is one of the countries where uh, the flag is the least. Uh, uh, Facebook often and Twitter and others offer the opportunity to flag uh, uh, content that is considered harmful. Uh, but, uh, and this goes back to education, there is a very little uh, understanding of uh, how flagging works. And, uh, and it's not just the lack of understanding, but it's also uh, these platforms, and we've seen it with the Francis Haugen revelation, makes it also not very easy for people who don't speak English and speak local languages uh, to engage with the platforms and the terms of reference in a language that is closer to themselves. So there is a lot of work to do in that space. Thank you so much. That's. Um... That's really helpful, and I think you're quite right. It's it's an incredibly complex um, area. So another question that we have here is, could you please expand on how you are engaging young people in the fight against hate speech? And I'm wondering if the USG um, would be willing to take that question on. Let's see if she's still here. Yes, there she is. Thank you. I'm still here, Jashri. Thank you very much. And um, relevant question uh, because um, 
young people um, are present um, online and we have lots of of course um, complaints most of the complaints that come in through are um, on, on online hate speech but as i said earlier uh, offline hate speech is really prevalent as well and uh, that we know that um, the genocides that uh, happened in uh, against the tutsi in rwanda and uh, the holocaust and in srebrenica all of them happened before we had online presences and all of them were preceded and accompanied uh, by hate speech so we are engaging young people through the school system um, because um, it's easier to reach young people that way. I'm already working with um, teachers and learners on, on curriculums and the uh, ways in which people can identify his speech. But uh, I would say uh, that importantly, um, beyond um, curriculums, uh, that uh, we are also working with, um, with the radio. Lots of people still listen to radio. Um, we are talking, we are working with the graphic artists, we are, we are working with the people who are able to reach the youth. Um, all these uh, people who create the memes that are sent out on, on WhatsApp groups, um, working with them so that to provide um, answers, um, because most young people tell us that when they hear something that is clearly hate speech, that they do not know what to respond in turn. So if you check out um, our website and also the, the UN's website, we now have created quite a huge number of small bite-sized sentences that people can use to counter hate speech for, for young people especially. But I would say that ultimately um, the, the key lesson that we, we are putting out to young people is that hate speech is the end product is the end product of stereotypes and prejudices. And um, really all that usually one needs is power to act on the prejudices and stereotypes. So it's extremely important to st start dealing with this. So we stop referring to ethnic uh, groups uh, in a negative way. Um, we, we stop um, en enhancing, we call out uh, parents, call out um, our teachers when we can, when um, we hear that, um, they are putting out this kind of negative stereotypes because these negative stereotypes really then build up uh, to hate speech. But we are also putting out lots of information um, through curriculums and uh, extracurricular activities, sports, especially um, on uh, hate speech, but also on genocide. We try to, as much as possible, to ensure that people understand that there's a direct link between hate speech and genocide, that we don't have a single genocide that was not preceded uh, by hate speech, that dehumanized those who are to be killed with the Tutsi uh, being called cockroaches, with the Rohingya um, having, of course, been called as fleas, um, the Jews were being referred to as cancers that needed to be removed, and that unless we speak to those specifics of everyday life, um, then hate speech becomes this um, this thing that um, we read about in newspapers and that feels like it's so far from us. So really the ability to translate uh, hate speech on a day-to-day -day basis as something that's happening to us on a day-to-day -day basis is, is the kind of information that we are giving out to the youth. Thank you. Thank you so much, USG. Uh, we really appreciate that intervention as well. Um, we're seeing a lot of questions around the tensions between freedom of speech and democratic society and hate speech. And I think this is really a question of how do democratic societies, you know, deal with this and what is the best way to manage these tensions? And I'm I'm thinking, Professor Shahid, if you could uh, respond to that, please, we'd be grateful for your insights. Right. Uh, thank you very much. You know, I think, you know, we should understand that freedom of expression actually is a tool against hate speech. Um, that uh, that rather than only restricting uh, speech, that the way should be to encourage people to use speech to challenge, to contest hateful narratives. And it is it is when that space opened up that it works. So the law is one thing. The law, of course, must maintain a very high threshold of ensuring that everybody can speak um, you know, uh, without without chilling effect of being found uh, to be have broken the law, but of course, you know, criminalized at very very high threshold. So the Rabatana faction identifies six 
elements which can contribute to uh, a threshold that can determine criminal, uh, you know, criminalization. This would be the the speaker, this the speaker himself or herself, the influence as speaker. Um, the con what is said, the content also matters. The um, then the context matters. In what context was was this said? How often was it repeat repeated? And how likely was go was this going to create violence? And what is can you identify intent in that? So if there's intentional intent to create imminent violence, then of course that is a threshold that has to the United state must prohibit. At other levels, of course, it must look at other ways of responding to this. And what is what is most suitable is to ensure that a diversity of view, views can be aired, but then people would co contest hatred when, 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 that is, when that is spoken. So the worst situation would be when people don't speak out for other people, when they, when, when they are, you know, when, when they are, you know, when offensive speech is being targeted at, at them. Prejudice, bias is not something all of us, any of us can escape. I think we all bring with us some perspectives, some biases, some prejudices, or even unconscious bias. And of course, the way to deal with them would be to be able to speak about them and to have them contested and, and openly engage with them. So overly broad bans on speech results in what Professor Williams referred to as, you know, maintenance of, of hegemonies that are existing. But the key thing would be to encourage people to speak out, to encourage people to have more platform speak. I referred to Professor Chirian George's um, uh, book on hate spin, uh, where he points out that if you, you know, there are sometimes hate speakers who target audiences um, in the hope that they will respond with violence or some, something else, or somehow use the, or invoke a law to ban that. And therefore then showing that these people are not able to absorb democratic, if you like, princ principles. So it actually serves to do that. So in other words, rather than use the law to, to you know, criminalize speech or to, pr or to uh, pr prevent speech, it must be the use of social goods, uh, social engagement, um, counter speech. I think uh, one of the speakers referred to counter narratives. Using counter narratives, uh, experiences of solidarity with other people, and refuting claims that works better than trying to sort of you know uh, not have issues discussed. But there are red lines. Red lines are those that clearly incite uh, discrimination or violence against people. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much indeed, Professor Shahid. I I think. You know, the notion of of presenting these counter narratives is is really important. Some somebody that has informed my thinking a lot is, you know, Chimamanda Adichie's idea around, you know, the danger of a single narrative and that these can be used to great effect and to great harm. But that use of also storytelling itself of a counter narrative can also combat that. Um, and in some cases, even heal some of that. Um, I, I'd also like to just turn to um, Professor Williams and, and go back a little bit on also, you know, what is the place of history in, in the fight against hate speech? And I guess I'm also interested um, at some point in this conversation of, you know, talking about some of the solutions that work that I think Professor Shahid was um, just beginning to touch on as well, but please over to Professor Williams as well. Thank you. Yeah, in terms of the place of history, I think it's really important for us to acknowledge how the history is really not so far away. I think often, especially in the US with it being such a young country, people have the idea that, um, you know, the great injustices that we talk about um, first and foremost being slavery, that that was such a long time ago, and it really wasn't. Uh, if we think about it in terms of long human lifespans, um, the ending of slavery, if we think about it, is sort of like roughly 1860, 1860 through that 1867 period, um, was really only two long human lifespans away. That's not as far ago, uh, far back as we like to think that it is. Um, and so that's why this cry to say where sort of more conservative people like to say, I didn't have anything to do with that. Um, why do we have to talk about this part of our past? Why do we have to keep bringing it up? Um, I think for people who were not directly descendants of or directly related to or recipients of the harm caused by that slavery, the transatlantic slave trade, then it feels a lot further away than it actually was. Whereas those of us who are still members of that community and are still receiving that collective harm and trauma, 
um, it feels much closer. And so we really have to acknowledge how the power that was displaced from the building of this country really still exists. And we're still trying to redistribute that power. And in order to do that, we have to acknowledge just how close that history was um, and how, how damning it was really for the foundation of this country to be built on slavery. Um, you know, enslaved peoples built the entire US. And if we aren't willing to just start there and talk about that, um, then we can't really even talk about this idea of hate speech or free speech and sort of some of the tensions that people were talking about before. Um, because I think, as I was saying, there's this um, need to really lean into, well, we can say whatever we want in this country, right? Because it's sort of um, this free speech era um, without consequences. And so, yeah, if we're free to, to say whatever we want, we need to also be free to make those connections with the past and today as well. Thank you so much, Professor Williams. Um, I'd like to turn the next question to, um, to Professor Carlson. Um, and the question for you, Professor, is really around, you know, are there any success stories? Are there any best practices? What, what are, you know, the solutions, I think, um, is the question that we have. And, and I guess, given your background as well, could you also, you know, frame that in, in a, around, let's say, the online community as well? Because I think we all understand that hate speech has existed for a long time. But, you know, creating a hate campaign, say, in the 1980s was just as expensive as producing a campaign that you were doing, you know, for something that was, you know, let's say above board. But now you can simply go online, produce something, and it's, it's out in an hour. So really interested to get your thoughts on, on that as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great question. And actually... Um, Thinking about the tension between free expression and um, hate speech, I think it's important. Uh, one of the other panelists noted kind of um, the importance of counter speech and counter narratives. I just want to remind our viewers that we, while we might have a right to free expression here in the United States, we don't have a right to free expression online. And so uh, I just like to always remind people and remind my students that these are private virtual spaces um, that are free to regulate expression in any way they choose. And so we're in this situation where we've got these powerful companies acting as arbiters of speech. And the reality is, is they can go much further than the law to eradicate this kind of expression. And I think we've seen as uh, Professor Williams was talking about the history, we know historically that media has been used to amplify these messages of hate to great detriment. And so I think it's really important as we think about how do we combat this, there's a difference between legally protecting hate speech and handing a microphone or a megaphone um, to people with these hateful viewpoints. Um, in terms of successes, one of the things that I think is really important to keep in mind is just the persuasiveness of interpersonal communication. I think, you know, hashtags are great for raising awareness, but anytime we've really seen improvements on this issue, the hashtag is followed up with um, actual kind of in-person conversations, one-on-one, -on -one, that that really, I think, um, is what helps people feel, again, we've talked about the consequences of their actions. Um, the other thing that I would um, probably point to is just this idea that there have been successful partnerships between governments and uh, social media platforms. But again, I think we need to keep in mind that the goal of media platforms is to make money. And so um, another panelist had mentioned the Francis Hogan kind of revelations. We know that these algorithms are essentially, you know, tweaked to keep us on the platform as long as possible. And, and doing that favors extreme content. And so I think there needs to be this balance between oversight of online spaces um, by by governments and other other regulatory bodies. Um, but I do, you know, on a positive note, I do think that there have been um, campaigns that have at least raised awareness about the harm of hate speech, 
Um, and I think, you know, convincing not just regular folks, but also the people that potentially benefit. So for example, advertisers on social media companies to really say, hey, we're not gonna put up with this. Don't put my my ads in places and spaces where hate speech proliferates. Um, I think we really need to rely on those with power in this situation. And I, I again, wanna kind of call back to Professor Williams. I think this is a problem that especially those of us who benefit from the historically um, racist system that we're living in really need to be the ones to speak out. And so when I talk about interpersonal communication, I think there's a lot of work for white folks to do um, to, to really speak out against these issues. So again, just thrilled to be here today. And I think we've heard so many good ideas. And I would just encourage everybody in this room who's, who's participating, who's listening to, you know, if you see something, say something, um, to not be afraid to counter hate speech. If we want to change the world, we have to change the world around us. And so I just encourage people to to speak out when they encounter um, th this this kind of rhetoric. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, I, I really appreciate that. I, I know we're just hitting our the end of our um, time here together. And if if the presenters do have time and if folks do have time to stay online, I, I just wanted to ask one last really quick question to the presenters. Um, what we're seeing in our chat is, of course, a lot of sentiments about how we need to continue moving together in sharing awareness and knowledge and hope um, to support one another on on this issue. So I really want to end on that note of, you know, togetherness that we're we're feeling here in this place. And I want to give uh, each of the presenters, if you have time, maybe just a really quick 30 second, one minute um, note on, you know, just how are you gauging success of the anti hate speech work you're you're doing and that of your institution. So maybe we could start uh, with the USG for a, a very brief last word. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashri. And first, uh, to say that uh, in the chat box, we've, we've shared uh, the UN strategy and plan of action on his speech. We've also shared the detailed guidance on implementation for UN entities. We've also shared the UN guidance note on COVID-19 related hate speech. And um, that um, speaks to the many dimensions that hate speech takes. That uh, I would say that um, hate speech um, is, is, is this, um, in this space that we are in, in the context that we are in, that quite um, a lot of dimensions of, of hate speech um, are happening and that it's important to take hate speech that way contextually, but also in terms of the dimensions that it takes. So we are available. Uh, if you click on this, uh, any of these documents, will lead you to our website and you can reach us there. We will tell you about uh, the community of practice, for example, that is in Southeast Asia. There's a community of practice at countering hate speech. We will tell you about uh, schools that are already teaching um, on hate speech. We'll give you quite a bit. So there we are. Well, you can reach us on that space. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, USG. Professor Shahid, please. Thank you. I'll make two observations. One is I've been part of something called the Faith for Rights Framework at the USCHR. Um, and uh, we've developed a toolkit, educational toolkit, whereby we teach everybody the importance of peer-to-peer -peer learning and of respect and diversity. That, that's one. The other is my work on combating anti-Semitism. I'm pleased to say that has has made some impact in terms of raising the profile of the issue within the UN system. There is now a focal point at the UN to work on this subject and a desk dedicated to this work as well. And also, I think a better better coordination between the UN and other actors on how to combat this. I think the increased awareness and willingness and um, manifest commitment to combating anti-Semitism is something I would regard as, as, as important. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, and now, if I could turn the floor to Professor Gagliardone, please. 
Well, I'm, I'm speaking in particular about universities and what we are trying to do, because uh, uh, we talked about imbalances in power and have they had historical roots of these. There are very uh, many imbalances in terms of the production and dissemination of knowledge. Uh, the, the, the leading uh, ger academic journals uh, tend not to accept a lot of articles coming from uh, uh, scholars and uh, in uh, African institutions. So we, 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 we are working on that a lot and uh, both uh, trying to understand, you know, reverse engineering uh, uh, some of the 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 uh, uh, the principles for 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 accepting this knowledge, but also aggressively and with greater uh, confidence, uh, trying to speak uh, our own language, and which is a language that is diverse. Uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, I happen to be in the in the humanities, and and I have a feeling that the humanities in the global south have, are in a position of strength, uh, like uh, it has never happened before. And so again, it's a long story, it's a long trajectory. But uh, but things are changing, and uh, and the ability to intersect uh, with the with the mainstream and and challenge and contest it and and creatively and constructively pr propose new ways to look at things uh, uh, are are available are increasingly available. And and one just point, if I may, that I want to make in response to one of the questions that was asked, uh, uh, and it was uh, uh, I think it was some of us uh, talking about we teach students. What about the people in the street? And I think this is a huge issue because we tend to speak about uh, among like-minded individuals. Uh, I I believe there is no haters or no people in this group or in the audience. Uh, and that's the challenge. How do we reach? How do we are able to engage? How don't we avoid uh, creating a sort of ventriloquism where we just uh, create this group that, that uh, use and reuses certain words, but then is unable to act in those spaces where these things actually happen. I think that's a big challenge, but it's also one of the reasons why hate speech continues to thrive. And, and despite we continuing to, to point fingers at what or, or, or to more broadly uh, uh, create awareness on, uh, on what is going on. And uh, I unfortunately have no solution in that space, but, uh, but uh, we need to work on that. Well, thank you for pitching that provocative question at the end of our of our discussion. I think uh, it's something that we need to think about, and I feel like this will not be the end of of these discussions that we'll be having. If I may, I would like to turn the floor to Professor Williams, and I think after that we'll have Professor Carlson. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for this last sort of word. I think for me, one of the things I really cling to is that the students are making so many changes um, with each new sort of iteration of students every year. I see um, there's so much more willingness to think about and talk about the things that our parents or our grandparents just absolutely refuse to talk about um, or refuse to be flexible about. Um, there's so many times when I've stepped into a class especially as a black woman and have thought I'm going to be teaching on critical race theory. I'm going to be teaching on something that some conservative students might not like. And I genuinely do fear for my life because I teach at public institutions. Um, and in the US, you know, where there's so much gun violence, there is always the opportunity for something terrible to happen. Um, and I've been fortunate in that it hasn't. And actually a lot of the students that I thought would um, would be the most outspoken or the most uncomfortable with the things that I had to say were the ones who ultimately changed their minds and were really thankful that they took my class. And so I think because this generation of students is so much more open and so much more willing, um, I think we are making progress, it's incremental, but I do agree with Professor Carlson that the interpersonal politics are so important and that the students can't just stop with the knowledge that they gain in our classrooms, they have to really take that outside of the walls of the academy and really have those conversations with grandpa and great uncle whoever at the table during the holidays, right? The kinds of people who carry familial knowledge and really challenge that familial knowledge and those narratives. Um, because ultimately, those are the people that are voting and who are putting people in power. So the interpersonal really does impact the political and we need to help our students see that more. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and we'll now turn the floor to Professor Carlson, please, for your last word as well. Well, I I think Professor Williams stole my answer because I actually was also thinking about the students. Um, to me, that is like the place and space of hope. Um, they are so much more 
empathetic, uh, willing uh, to talk about and acknowledge things like their own privilege, their complicit um, kind of benefit in this this racist or unjust system. Um, to me, they are, I, I have a lot of hope in seeing how they respond to um, increased awareness about things like hate speech. And I, you know, the other thing, it was um, interesting. So I had class the morning after the shooting, the recent shooting here in Buffalo, the racially motivated shooting. And, you know, we kind of scrapped what we were doing and decided to talk about and focus on, you know, how did we get there and what does it mean? Um, and one of the things we did during that discussion was started to just look up statistics about public opinion on different issues. And we were really surprised pleasantly to see, you know, there are more people in the United States, at least, that support gay marriage than don't. Um, there are more people who who recognize racial inequity than don't. And so I think sometimes, whether it's conservative voices or other voices of hate are are the loudest, but they're not necessarily the majority. And so I think it's important to recognize that there are a lot of people who value and, and respect dignity um, in all people. And so to not feel um, discouraged, I guess, in this fight against hate speech. The last thing I'll say, too, is I think in terms of social media in particular, it's getting better. Um, I can honestly point to I finished my PhD in 2013, so it's almost been exactly 10 years and there is a marked difference. My dissertation was about hate speech on social media, um, and I know that things have gotten better than they were. They're not perfect and we've got a long way to go, but the 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 momentum is moving, I think, in the right direction. And so, you know, this combination of of changes in, in online regulation, I mentioned the DSA earlier, things are are shifting. Um, and then again, the students' willingness to address these issues gives me a lot of a lot of hope um, and faith in in the future. Thank you so much. I, I really want to extend a, a, a heartfelt thank you to all of the presenters today. And I would like to ask all of you if you wouldn't mind, just as we say our final words of goodbye to our, colleagues who have joined us online to please turn your cameras on if you would be so kind um, just so everyone can see you and recall all of you um, as we say goodbye so to our audience i would just like to say um, thank you again to these amazing speakers it's been our privilege to be with you today um, and for you to really enlighten us and to you know further this discourse and to share information, as I think many of our colleagues who joined us were talking about. Um, and I will just say that the UN, as we all know, was established in 1945 in the shadow of the horrors of the Second World War and the Holocaust. And member states pledged to work together to protect future generations from the scourge of war and to build a world in which all could live with dignity and peace. So our panel has contributed significantly to developing this world of inclusivity and peace and dignity. So we thank you for this um, to build resilience against the corrosiveness of hate speech. And to our audience as well, I just wanted to um, let you know that we also have an amazing article by a young scholar um, written by a student in the Caribbean with her own view on the critical relevance of combating speech um, through innovative media. So we encourage you to read that. And last housekeeping note, we'd be so grateful if all of those of you who joined us, if you could kindly complete a brief online survey and the link will be placed in the, in the chat now. And if you could do that, we'd be very, very grateful indeed. And we will send out the recording, and if we're able to, we'll also send the great links and information that our panelists shared today as well with you. So thank you again very, very much, and we hope that we get to engage with all of you soon on this very, very important subject. Wishing you a great day and a great evening. Thanks and goodbye. <laughs>